right. So um, I will assure you that this wasn't actually intentional for me to follow Brian with um, another talk about performance in JavaScript. Um, but luckily, we're not talking about the exact same thing. So that helps, because he'd probably do a little better than me, maybe. Um, yeah, so Brian talked mostly about, you know, the philosophy um, of, you know, kind of what you should be looking for. Um, but, you know, when it comes down to, you know, actually trying to measure these things, how do we actually do that? And um, one thing I'd actually like to do, too, is uh, I'd like to thank Brian for, you know, pushing me into doing this. Um, probably wouldn't have done it on my own. Um, and then I'd like to thank Derek for giving me the opportunity to do so. So I am going to kick off this talk with um, an analogy. Um, so what is that performance? Uh, let's say you're driving down um, an empty highway, uh, which is kind of hard to find in North California, but imagine <laughs> it if you can, um, without a speedometer. Um, and you know, basically, you don't know how fast you're going. Um, but sooner or later, someone's probably, oh, let me just, I'm going to talk with my slides here. There's the highway. Okay, if you didn't notice. Someone's probably going to notice, um, you know, how fast you're going. So, um, how do we measure an app's performance? <laughs> um, what is our speedometer? So luckily, there is actually a number of um, APIs at our disposal, uh, disposal that can actually act as our speedometer. Uh, most of them have either full browser adoption. Um, some of them are getting you know, pretty close to full browser adoption. And then there's a few that are still kind of working drafts. Um, but today, I hope that I can shed a little bit of light on a few of these. So let's start um, again with my you know, long-winded W3C docs of some history. All right, I'll hopefully it won't be that bad. So in the beginning, <laughs> in the beginning, there was the date. And the date was good um, for dates, but uh, not so much for measuring stuff. So the way we used to you know, measure the speed between something was basically to take the, you know, the timestamp that was given by date.now and um, you know, subtract that from another date.now and hope for the best. Um, precision um, was down to the millisecond. Um, milliseconds are fine. OK, but uh, don't get me wrong. But consider this, right? So in order for an animation to play smoothly on a, on a device, um, they need to at least play at 60 frames per second, uh, which means that all the code that is needed to draw a single frame um, has to happen in 16.67 milliseconds. So that doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room when you're trying to measure um, you know, kind of something that is happening in one frame. Um, so now with that in mind, I'm going to introduce you to the high resolution timestamp. Um, this is the sleeker and sexier version uh, of the standard timestamp. Oh, oh, don't, don't do that. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm not as, I'm not as suave with the, um, with the, uh, you know, with these as, as Brian is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So actually, let's get out of here. And I've got some actual examples for you. OK, so here we go. A little bit of code examples. Um, so you can see the timestamp right here. Um, and then the high resolution timestamp. Um, this guy's got um, precision down to 1,000th of a millisecond, uh, a little bit better. Uh, and you can get a hold of one of these by using performance.now. Um, so sorry, one thing. All right, let's, let's keep going here. OK, so first thing you might notice is that the timestamps obviously look a little bit different. Um, now, the original timestamp is based on the Unix epic. And I'm sure we're all fairly you know, familiar with that, for those who aren't. Um, it's the interval of time since January 1st, 1970. Um, and you know, it's been a while. Uh, so the second timestamp is actually based on the navigation epic, uh, which is basically the time that um, your browser started looking for your website. Um, now, another property that actually differentiates these two is the clock that is actually used to measure them. So the original timestamp uses the computer clock. Um, isn't exactly the most reliable thing. Um, it is, in particular, I guess, NTP adjustments, uh, leap seconds, user configurations even. So you know, just how you set your clock um, can actually mess with the time that's reported 
So if anything changes that um, in the website or you change that in the middle of something, uh, web, you know, anything that's using that as a basis of you know, how fast something is, um, is you know, it's gonna be, it could be completely inaccurate. If you were to set your clock back, you could get, you know, end up with negative numbers even. So the high resolution timestamp um, does away with all that. Um, it's based on a monotonic and uniformly increasing to, uh, clock that isn't subject to manipulations, uh, makes the ac uh, measurements a lot more accurate. Um, so the high res timestamp is actually the fundamental building block. You know, if I wanted to show this, you know, little. I love my, you know, my gifts, so I'm just gonna, you know, do it. There we go. It's a fundamental <laughs> building block uh, for basically all the performance APIs um, as we move forward here. Okay. Um, so, as a starting point in our API journey, we're gonna start with the navigation timing API. Um, this can be access, accessed through um, performance.timing, and I guess a little bit, obviously, I think by now, um, all of your you know, performance API is pretty much housed under the performance object uh, available natively um, to you through JavaScript and that magic. So, um, basically, first thing, you know, performance.timing uh, is gonna return to you a performance timing object um, this is going to uh, contain basically all the data you're going to need to know from when the uh, website started loading. You know what? This is why I probably should do things all with slides. Huh? Anyways, um, navigation timing. So console log the performance timing. This is what it's going to give you. And you've got all of the you know things you could ask for from nav navigation start all the way to the load event end. Basically the entire you know from when you're Again, when, the, when we started looking for the website, all the way down to when it finally loaded. Um, I'm not gonna go through all these. Um, they're readily available in your console. Anybody who's got a computer can you know, look it up right now. Um, you're all gonna notice one thing, obviously, and that is that uh, all of these are standard timestamps. Um, so, you know, obviously I'm wrong about, you know, everything being uh, high res. Um, this is actually because this part of the API uh, was written before the timestamp was, uh, high res timestamp was available. If you actually wanna get a hold of the high res version, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, I'm gonna explain a bunch of this later, but basically um, with the performance API, um, you can get entries by type. Um, so this will actually load the navigation entry from the buffer it's the, you know it's the only one available. Um, log that, and then this is the same amount of stuff, uh, kind of a little bit more, but this is all based on high res timestamps from the start of navigation. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about um, how we got those. Um, so the performance buffer, um, all of a site's performance data uh, data is uh, loaded into a buffer, and that buffer exposes a very simple API um, that can be used for interacting with the entries. Um, so basically, I wanted to show a little bit. So this is a very simple example. Um, we can get all of the entries available currently uh, from you know from the load of this website right here. Um, and then just loop over the entries and kind of display them here. So this is basically the, the first one I showed you, the navigation, and then we also see every single resource that was loaded in my hastily thrown together um, Express.js app. Cool. Okay. All right, so. Uh, there's a slide I didn't use. Oh, there's a core <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Everybody know what that is? I don't know. Maybe you don't. All right. So um, that kind of covers all the data you get for free uh, from the performance API. Um, still, you know, it's still pretty substantial amount of data you can use. You can use this. Uh, you can use this stuff um, to, you know, kind of figure out a whole bunch of different kind of things that you want to know from the app. Um, you could, you know, total page load times there. Um, the page rendering time is there. Request response times there. 
all you got to do is just kind of figure out, you know, what, which ones you got to look at, and that, and you know, you got you got a whole bunch of stuff that's available to you, um, a bunch of you know, chrome extensions, even like you know, Lighthouse, as, as Brian was uh, explaining, uses you know this kind of data um, to display a bunch of the met metrics they use um, to measure your site. Um, but you know, what if uh, we wanted to measure the performance of things that take place like after page load? Um, so you know, perhaps we wanted to measure the speed of these user interactions going on here. You know, that's uh, something we want. If, if someone's typing this fast, we want to make sure that our app is performing, you know, adequately. Um, so the uh, w you know the the one that we want to use for this, uh, can't remember which one. I'm supposed to be telling. Okay, user timing API. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. So the user timing API um, allows us to accurately measure the interval between kind of uh, two distinct moments in time. Um, this API kind of, the, the real meat of it exposes two uh, functions that we kind of want to focus on. Um, this is the performance mark and performance measure functions. Um, and from, you know, like I got promised, W3C, you know, oh, no, I didn't even get the W3C for that. Let's, let's skip back a bit. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. Let's take a look at some of these. So with the performance mark uh, function, you can basically set um, a mark in time. Um, and basically, all it really does is it has a tag for the mark um, where you can reference it in the buffer, um, which adds an entry that also has the timestamp available as to when, you know, when the, that mark was set. Um, so if based on this code, you're ba we're basically going to, you know, we're going to set our first mark, we're going to do some work for three seconds, then we're going to set a second mark. And can run this really easily. It's working, and then second mark set. Um, cool. So now that we've got this mark set, we're gonna figure out you know, where they go and how do we get them. So uh, referencing back to our performance buffer and how we work with entries, um, this is a bunch of code. Um, probably not gonna read that all, but. There are, you know, three general, you know, ways to kind of uh, access, like access <coughs> the entries that we set. Um, first one is to kind of just get all of the entries, uh, loop through them, check the ones that are of the type mark, and uh, you know, and, and work with that. Um, we can also get entries by type, uh, the type obviously being mark, and then we can just get each one of those and kind of look for the one we're we're particularly interested in. And then, if we want to get super granular, then we can look for entries by name, and that's basically the tag that uh, you know that we set in the initial uh, initial thing when we saw that. So, obviously, very simple. If we get all the entries and we just look for the ones by mark, the ninth and tenth entry in the buffer is our marks. Um, secondly, if we get the marks by type of mark, we can see every single mark that we set, and then the third one we're looking for a particular mark um, by that name. Uh, cool. Why is the duration zero? Isn't it D3? Um, these were just, they're just set, and that's it. Um, so the duration of it took to set the mark is oh, zero, okay. yeah. And so you've got the start time of the mark itself. Um, and then, then you've got the duration of how long it actually took to set this mark. Okay. Um, yeah, and so yeah, each of these returns an array, so each time you're working with an array. Um, now eventually you're going to want to you know, remove these marks. Um, the performance buffer itself uh, does have a limited number of entries. Um, generally it's about 150. Um, for resources, so if you're like downloading, if you're downloading things, so a resource entry is basically just anything you've requested from the server. Uh, JavaScript, CSS files, these all count as resources. You can actually set the limit yourself. Um, but most browsers are somewhere around the 150 mark for actually for custom marks. Um, it's changed a bit now, but I will talk about that later. Um, so when you want to actually get rid of a mark, use clear marks. Um, this one, you can pass the name of the mark you want to clear, or if you just want to get rid of all of them, pass it without anything. 
super simple. We got rid of the you know second uh, the first mark. Now we've got the second mark, and we get rid of all of them. Okay. So that's kind of the basic. Um, it's kind of just the basic introduction to how to you know how to set marks and measure things. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about. Um, here, let's go back. Um, <laughs> Where would be a well, that's, uh, Okay, this actually just kind of fell off. <laughs> Does this work in a pocket? Yeah, still recording. Still recording? All right. I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's it. That's the, uh, you know, that's the end. <laughs> okay, so. Obviously, um, you know, taking a look at how we would set and measure marks, um, you can probably imagine that doing this in like an app itself would be not exactly too succinct or you know scalable. You're going to be littering your code with like you know with marking, measuring, and then trying to you know try to figure that, you know figure all those out and like you know where do you put them, where do you send back these marks and stuff like you. Uh, it's it's not exactly you know it's it's very it's very synchronous. Um, so for, for a while, this was mitigated by you know, just kind of creating a long pole um, and then just polling you know, occasionally to see if new marks were set. Um, the kind of irony of that is the fact that you know, that's got a bit of a performance overhead of itself. You know, continuously polling for, you know, for things, even if they're not set, is not super great. Um, so luckily, um, there was a spec that was formalized a while ago, um, and last year, was kind of made more available. Um, Chrome 52 introduced uh, the Performance Observer, um, and as it would kind of, you know, be obvious, um, the Performance Observer kind of it observes a performance timeline, looks for marks, and uh, can, you know, looks for marks that are recorded, and then you can do something with them in a more asynchronous fashion. Um, now. <laughs> Although this uh, method is worlds better than previous, um, it should be noted that it still does incur performance overhead. Um, this is from the W3C docs. Um, just keep in mind, um, you should only subscribe to the, you know, the, the events that you actually want to measure. Um, there is a significant amount of events that are measured, um, so you're going to get bombarded with those. And also make sure you, you, know, you disconnect your observers after you're done with them so that you can kind of clean that up and then only kind of reconnect when you when is like necessary. Um, yeah, and so um, now that you've got the rundown for this, uh, let's take a look at you know some of this. This is super simple. So basically, what I got here, um, you've got your you know it's easy to register an observer. Um, you just create a new perf like performance observer. Uh, pass in the function, the callback you want to make. Um, in this case, we're just, you know, going to obviously just output all the entries to the timeline, or sorry, to the console. Um, observer, then observe. You can, you know, check the entry types you want to listen for. So in our case, we're looking for mark and measure, um, but you can observe any kind of, you know, any sort of uh, event that you want to look for. And the buffered equals uh, buffered true uh, property set just means that we're also accepting entries that are made into the buffer as well. Um, that includes like resources and stuff like that. Anything that's um, outside of you know outside of like uh, after you know uh, anything that's outside of the observer. So then in this case, so I'm going to do the same as my first kind of uh, my first kind of example. Now the observer is listening for the name. There's a first mark. There's a second mark. So we've got both of those in, in there. This makes it a hell of a lot uh, more succinct. Um, it also keeps the code out of our regular app code. Uh, we can put this, you know, somewhere else to kind of run, and just, you know, only really looking for the metrics that we really want, to, and then, uh, you know, pass that off to the server. Um, obviously, this is a very simplistic example, but you could see how this could easily be used to kind of create an entire like performance infrastructure for an app uh, and start marking whatever you know whatever pieces of code that are important to you. Okay, um, so almost done here. Now the last one that I've got for you is the server timing API and. 
This one's very much still a work in progress. Uh, as of the talk that I'm giving right now, um, the latest W3C draft came out, I think it was last week, maybe last Monday. Um, there's currently no official support um, in any browsers, but both Chrome, um, Chrome and Opera um, are both kind of supporting this in their developer tools. Um, so you can actually take a look at this from now. Um, so what is uh, the, like, uh, the, the, uh, the server timing API? Um, well, simply, it is kind of just the missing piece of the performance puzzle for us um, when it comes to measuring from front end performance. Um, more descriptively, it allows us to map the entire journey from like initial request to the website, um, to routing that to the routing that takes place, and to the database or service requests that are being made, and then to our app to load and render and stuff like that. So, more succinctly, it's basically a set of headers um, that get passed along from the server that can kind of denote um, each particular step that your app took to kind of get uh, the information to you. Um, so basically, um, how can we use this today? Um, the header itself is actually very simple. Um, so server timing, um, the next portion is obviously the time that it took. And then you give kind of like a tag of what it is that you're like looking at. So you know, 100, 100 milliseconds for a database lookup kind of thing is what we're looking at there. Um, so it's pretty easy to take a look at this. Um, an, so there's basically a number of packages already for a bunch of like very popular frameworks on the back end that will support this. Uh, since I'm obviously using Node to serve mine, there is actually a server timing, um, there's a server timing like module available. Um, if you want to check that out, I'll make this available as well at the end. Uh, there's also a number of other ones. This kind of has been implemented a couple of different times with a couple of different APIs. Um, but once you've installed it, um, it's pretty easy. So, open the console first. So this is kind of what it looks like in the app. It's super simple. This is basically just taken from the GitHub, um, like the repo. Um, but just use server timing, and then you can basically just set metrics and kind of denote what the time is, and then this is the tag that we're talking about that gets sent back. So if I actually run this, and you actually click on the network request, you'll actually see that there's a, you know, normally there's a timing um, portion of it. If you scroll down to the bottom, you actually get the server timing portion, and here's all the marks that we set. That's so cool. HTTP API, cache, database. So a lot of, I mean, a lot of these things are already, you know, like, are, like a lot of the back end in, you know, if, if we're working at LinkedIn, all these things are usually and like, you know, generally cached somewhere. And they're, you know, generally reporting all these metrics normally, but there usually ends up as a disconnect somewhere uh, for us as front end people to kind of like to try and find these metrics, you know, use them in our own reporting and stuff like that. So this just kind of gives an added layer to us to be able to you know, not only debug what's going on with the performance of our, you know, main app, but also, you know, like when you're trying to figure out time to first byte and like, you know, why does it seem longer for like, you know, for certain people, certain places, what, you know, so what's going on, is, you know, you can, you can get a good breakdown here of every metric that would be kind of important to see. Um, so basically this obviously not fully supported yet, but can be started using. Um, uh, the adoption for the you know the adoption for these APIs has been actually pretty fast, so I would expect to see this pretty soon. Um, but until then, we can at least look at something that would be kind of fun to measure, which would be a balloon in <laughs> slow mo breakout. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> so that's it. That's all I got for you guys. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, you know it was it was not too bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>